Welcome, my friends. Welcome to my world. I'm your host, Kevin Rutherford. It is Monday, July 25th. I can't believe July is almost over already. We are here live today, and it is a free-for-all. It's up to you. What do you want to talk about today? If you have a question, a comment, a topic, anything goes. Phone lines are open right now. Uh, I have some things I can talk about, but uh, it's really about what you want to talk about today. 855 855- Nine five zero three eight three five. We can talk about trucks, money, fuel mileage, maintenance, tires, taxes, technology, health and fitness on the road, getting started as an owner operator, finding freight, working with brokers, getting your authority. You name it, we'll talk about it. All you have to do is pick up the phone and join us. If you dial right now, I promise you'll get through. We'll be here for the next hour or until we run out of calls. 855-950-3835. So a couple things I want to talk about today um, until we get some calls coming in. Things I've talked about before, I'm going to continue talking about when I have time, the economy and where we are in the industry right now. And it's really, you know, it's, it's fun and it's easy to pay attention to the industry when rates are going through the roof and we're talking about record setting rates over and over and record setting profit. It's fun to pay attention and be engaged then. A lot of times when the news starts turning bad, uh, we'd rather not pay attention. Sometimes that's when we'd rather just stick our head in the sand and ignore it. It's the worst time to ignore it. All of the opportunities are at the bottom of cycles and the, uh, the bottom of economies, never at the top. You know, think about the last couple of years. Everybody was making money with a truck. It was almost impossible not to. But now, now it's going to get much more difficult. But this is where all the opportunities are at the bottom. So, your job is to get yourself prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. Get ready to be in business. I'm not saying you should run out right now and buy a truck and get into business. In fact, that would be a bad idea. But now is the time to start getting ready because I think the bottom is probably somewhere between six to 18 months out from where we are right now maybe 24, this is the time to start getting ready for that. What does that mean to get ready? Um, Well, I'm going to talk about it in a little bit, but personally, we want to get our personal finances in order, understand what our net worth is and, and what we have for resources. Business, the way you get ready is you start understanding business. You start writing a good business model. I'll talk about how to do all these things. That's what it means to get ready to be in business. And then the longer the bottom takes to get here, the better prepared you're going to be. So what if it doesn't happen in six months or 12 or 18? What if it takes 24 before the opportunities really start to show up? Well, that would actually be a good thing. Unless you're completely prepared right now, and I can promise you most people aren't, start getting prepared. So let's, uh, let's think about that for just a second. A lot of people went out in the last six months and, and got into business. Those people are going to struggle. Some of them will survive, but many of them are going to fail because they did not give themselves any advantages. In fact, it's the exact opposite. They paid too much for the truck. They're they're paying too much for everything right now and rates are tanking fuel is still high this is not the time to try to be in a new business this is a tough time for established businesses but it's a great time to get ready so 
if you bought your truck six months ago, you probably bought it at the peak of prices. If you start getting ready now and you buy your truck six months to a year from now, you'll probably buy, be buying at the bottom of the pricing chart. That makes a huge difference. If you bought your truck and started in business six months ago, you only know how to operate when rates are this high. And they're still high. They're coming down, there's no doubt, but they're still what we could call higher than normal in many cases. We, <clears throat> excuse me, there may be a new normal. But if this is all you know, what are you going to do when rates are half of what they were at their peak? And I think they will drop that much. I think rates will drop by the end of this without the fuel surcharge, 40 to 50%. That's tough. But if you start getting ready for business now and you create a business plan that works with those rates, well, then you're all set. So timing is everything in business. The problem is most people get the timing exactly wrong just like people who invest without really preparing. Most people get into the stock market when it's at its highest, because that's when everybody's excited about it and they're talking about it. Very few individual investors get in at the bottom of the stock market because they're afraid of it then. That's when everybody's talking about how bad things are. But that's when you have to be buying. And we all know that. I mean, everybody knows the way to make money in the stock market is you have to buy low and sell high. That's how you make money investing in anything. You buy it when the price is lowest. You hope it appreciates. And at some point you sell it when it appreciates. And, and even though we know that and it's logical and simple, people still do all the wrong things. They invest when the prices are at the top. It's when everybody's talking about it and they're excited. And then they sell when prices are at the bottom because everybody's talking about how bad it is. You have to get yourself into a position where you're contrarian. You're doing the opposite of what most people are doing. Most people got their trucks in authority in the last year or three when the, everything was booming. Now is the time to be thinking about it, not then. You have a much, much better opportunity. So here's an example, and this ties in with uh, my other topic, um, which I'm going to get to. I'm also going to, I still have more to talk about on this topic. But my other topic was the, um, the strike in the ports, AB5. They're really trying to shut down those ports. Um, I hope they do. I know we have a lot of supply chain problems right now, but we need to start putting some pressure on the government to stop doing stupid shit like this. When we have supply chain issues is not when you pull something like this, like AB5. That is going to make our supply chain issues far worse. Well, let's just double down. I hope they hold steady in the ports. Now, they're, they're talking about trying to use legal action to get them out of there. Here's the problem I have with that. We have a clear law written about protesting in front of judges' homes, especially, but not limited to, Supreme Court judges, all judges. You can't protest in front of a judge's home to try to get them to change their mind. But that's what people are doing. They're trying to put pressure on the justices to change their mind. That's illegal. It's clearly illegal. We have a very clear law written about that. Yet the Department of Justice has done nothing for months while people protest every single day in front of Supreme Court justices' homes. So if these owner-operators in the ports want to block the ports, then I don't think they should be arrested either. You're either going to enforce the laws for everybody or enforce them for nobody. You can't pick and choose who you enforce laws for. So that's what's going on in the port. But listen to this, because here's one of the problems. And the government knows this. The government knows if they can hold out long enough that the owner-operators will probably 
cave eventually just because they'll run out of money. That That's really what will stop something like this from being effective. But as I was reading this, I read this paragraph and I thought, I should have known this was happening. I should have known it was coming. But I, I, I really, I didn't want to believe that this was happening. But it is, because here's an example of it. And if one person did this and it made it to an article, it was probably a whole lot more. So when I read this at first, I thought, wait a minute, how, you, how does that work? And then it dawned on me. So here's the paragraph. I'll read it to you and then I'll explain it. Um, let me kind of go back and give you some uh, context here. The self-employed truckers, quote, the self-employed truckers have no beef with the port, but they are using the unorthodox standoff to call on Governor Gavin Newsom to amend AB5, a controversial labor law, that they say could end their business model. No, not could end. It did end their business model. Some say they will continue the port shutdown until they get action from Sacramento. That's what I hope would happen, but, and there's always a but, but there are signs that members of the loose coalition of truckers who are not affiliated with a union are growing weary. Now, here's a quote from one of the people they're protesting. I don't know how long I can keep it up. We all have bills, said Long Mock. Long Mock, I guess that's his name. Um, who recently, listen to this, who recently took out a 30-year loan on a new $168,000 truck. But it's a matter of whether I can go back to work now and in a month or two, I'm forced out of business. Um, There's so many problems with this. When I read this, I'm like, wait a minute. Nobody would loan you money for 30 years on a commercial vehicle. Just does not happen. And then it dawned on me, oh no, there is one group stupid enough to loan somebody 168000 for 30 years on a commercial vehicle. And of course, it's the government. Remember the uh, idle loans? That's what this is. I guarantee you. It doesn't say that, but I guarantee you that's what that is. This is an idle loan. 30 years, 3% or whatever the rate was. Killer deal, but a really, really bad idea to finance a truck with. And if you understand the business model in the ports, and I was involved with the ports way back when in uh, Cleveland, the ports, wherever you are around the country, little ports, big ports, doesn't matter. Those tend to be owner operators who want to be home more often. That's why they work out of the ports because they're home every night for the most part. Those are pretty local uh, kind of shuttle jobs with containers and, and coming out of the ports. Now, there's some exceptions to that, but that's a big part of it. Because of that, there's more demand for those jobs for people who are tired of being on the road and away from home. Because there's more demand for the job, the, it pays less. Anybody who's run containers knows it pays less. Doesn't mean you can't make money. You can. If you know how to run that operation, you really can. But it pays less. You'll gross less. You have to understand how to control your cost in that operation. One of the big ways you do it, you don't buy $168,000 trucks. That's not the truck that belongs in the port. What belongs in the port, honestly, ten to $15,000 trucks. And you just keep them running. Pre-emission, um, I would still like electronics. I wouldn't go back to mechanical um, because I, I could get some pretty decent fuel economy out of a, you know, a late 90s, early 2000 pre-emission truck built right, inexpensive, easy to repair, no big expensive um parts like one boxes and I, that's the kind of truck you buy to make money in a local operation out of the ports not a hundred and sixty eight thousand dollar truck now here's the thing here's the other problem i have with the government this is a business failure because of the government if the idle loan didn't exist or if they would have qualified people for it which they clearly didn't 
this person would have never bought this truck and started this business. And they shouldn't have. It's going to be a spectacular failure for a lot of people. The finance company or the bank's going to lose. No, <laughs> what am I saying? The finance company or the bank. That's the government. That's us. We're going to lose money on his loan and lots of others like it. You know, when they came out with this, I thought, I wonder if people are going to take this loan and go buy a truck with it. And I was really hoping that they wouldn't or they wouldn't allow it, but they did. <sighs> He's worried. <sighs> He's worried about making this payment. And so I, I went and I did some numbers on this. 168000 I used the uh, idle loan interest rate and uh, did a 30-year mortgage on this. Okay, the payment. The payment on this mortgage, on this truck payment, not bad, honestly. It's a kind of a nice truck payment for a brand new truck, $1,061. But I can tell you that this guy won't make it. Even with that small payment, he's not going to make it. And if we actually go through the numbers, the math, if he managed to pay off this truck 30 years from now, or at some point, God, it's just, it's so stupid to even think about this, that the truck's not going to be paid for for 30 years. Um, but if you manage to pay off the entire mortgage, $364,000 is what he would pay for this truck. 364000 Now, I know most people that don't understand how to make money in this business think that it makes sense to have a new truck because you have a warranty and you don't have the risk and that's all bullshit. But a lot of people do that. M many of those people think they should be replacing a truck every four or five years and that's the profitable way. It's not. You buy a good truck, you spec it properly, you keep it as long as you can. That's how you make money. Very seldom, there are occasions, very seldom, does it ever make financial sense to buy a new truck? If you're improving your fuel economy enough, if you're lowering your maintenance cost enough, you might be able to justify it. Doesn't mean you shouldn't ever buy one, but you have to understand that it's hard to buy a new truck and make your profit go up. Almost always goes down for a while. Big payments, big insurance, still have maintenance. So, those people who think they should be replacing one every four or five years would really be screwed if they bought this. And here's why. At five years, let me find that. At five years, the balance on this five-year-old truck, which in most markets, a five-year-old truck is probably worth somewhere in the $50,000 range depending on how many miles you put on it, 40 or 50,000, you would still owe $147,000 on this truck after five years. Now, at 10 years, we're, we're looking at trucks that, you know, need in frames or it's just time to maybe retire them, depending on how well you took care of it. Um, at 10 years, now, 10-year-old trucks, we're talking fifteen or $20,000. That's what 10-year-old trucks typically sell for. Now, with inflation, those prices might stay higher, but it's all relative anyway. So we're talking about a truck at this point that's at best is worth $15,000, i am going to say. Uh, let's call it twenty, dollars um, just to be generous. You still owe $125,000 on that truck after 10 years of making those payments. Can we see how ridiculous this is? This is just one example. How many people went out and did this? It's, uh, that's just kind of crazy. All right, um, let me refresh my screen. What's going on here? I expected a bunch of calls already. I got none. What are you guys doing? Wake up. It's Monday. You can either listen to me talk for the next hour or you can pick up the phone and we'll find out what's on your mind. Um, you know, we have a pattern here and I don't mind it, but it would work better if people started calling early. People always wait and then we get to the end and then 
you know, I'm kind of trying to get through a whole bunch of calls. So pick up the phone and join me. It's a free for all. You have a question, a comment, a topic, anything goes, 855 855- Nine five zero three eight three five. You dial right now. I promise you'll get through. Lines are wide open. So, a lot of this has already gone on. Hey, here's the other crazy thing. Talking about this, I have plenty more I want to talk about. Um, this is still happening. I still that that stupid Ohio truck sales place every single day in my social media feed. I see these people smiling and shaking hands with the sales guy and behind them is a big old square nose classic and they're buying it right now. Prices are still too high. Fuel does not look like it's ever going to get any cheaper again. I don't know. Uh, It's hard to say. Fuel certainly could get cheaper with the right policies here in the United States. We could start pumping our own oil and keeping it right here in this country, and we could drop our fuel price a lot. But this administration clearly isn't going to do that. So as far as we can see, we'll be looking at uh, high fuel prices for quite some time. All right, I, uh, I still have some things I want to talk about um, getting yourself prepared for business, but finally people woke up and uh, phones are starting to light up. So I'll go find out what's on everybody else's mind, and uh, maybe I'll come back to this later if I need to. Let's go to Georgia to get started today. Eric, welcome to the program. So you were talking about the California courts and everything. Did you hear anything about this new um, free speech zone? Uh, free speech zone. That to me means anywhere in the United States. Yeah, they're uh, they're they're trying to make it illegal to uh, um, protest in front of the uh, uh, ports there. Uh, Well, okay. we made it illegal to protest in front of judges homes a long time ago, but they clearly have chosen to ignore that. No, I just got a kick out of that. I was I was I didn't read it. I heard it. But uh, and I heard it on that uh, that that other channel on that XM. (laughs) So are they I'm a little confused here, like a gun-free zone, we know those are dangerous because then the criminals know that nobody has guns in that zone. When they say free speech zone, are they really saying a no free speech zone? That's ex- Well, they're saying that you have to go to a free speech zone <laughs> in order to do free speech. Oh, yeah. Like I said, the <laughs> free is, speech zone is anywhere is on American soil. That's my free yeah, speech. I, just, I, I got kind of a kick out of it. I haven't had time to uh, to actually go in and research it and see what the hell is going on about it. But uh, but yeah, that's where our country's at right now. Yeah, it's uh, it, it, it's pretty insane. You know, I, I'm I'm glad these guys are standing up at the port and protesting this, and I hope they hold strong. I have a feeling they won't. I have a feeling that too many of them are in a financial position like this guy with the $168,000 truck in the port, um, which is a really bad idea, and it's financed for 30 years. Um, Those people aren't going to, they don't have the financial ability to hold out. It's a shame, and the government knows that. Yeah, you know, I I, I watch a lot of uh, little YouTube shorts and stuff like that. I follow a guy, uh, 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 the trucking news with my uh, my or whatever his name is um i'm I'm all fine with everything until they start pulling fifth wheel pins and stuff like that if you want if you want to do a proper block you know you just uh, keep walking in front of it that way you're not lawyering you're not breaking the law but you just walk in a circle yeah you know, and just just keep yeah. that thing locked down you know at, at this point you just said something and, and i i get what you're saying but at this point why not break the law Everybody else is. Yeah, I understand. We're, 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 the people that are going in there, they're, 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 they're locked in. You know, they're, they're, most of those are, are company drivers that, uh, that are just trying to do their job, too. So, I mean, I, I understand the, on both sides of it. And I, do, I do see where you're coming from. Uh, 
I just, I, I don't want to see anybody tear anybody else's stuff up. I, I get that. I, and I don't, I, I'm not talking about violence or, you know, sabotaging things. That That's not what I'm talking about at all when I say break the law. All I'm saying is if they are going to claim that just being there in the way is breaking the law and they're going to arrest people, then they better start doing that at the justice's home as well. Oh yeah! Oh yeah! No, no, I agree with that. Yeah, if they're gonna if they're gonna make it a, uh, uh, a not a free speech zone, yeah, I would I would totally still still break the law on that. I just don't I don't want to see anybody pulling people's no wheels no I'm, I'm flashing tires exactly. Or, I'm not talking about that at all, and I'm not talking about violence or, or sabotage. None of that. All I'm saying is, if they're going to claim that it's against the law for them to be there and protest, then break the law. I absolutely agree. Well, I'm going to get back to listening to you, man. Those are great open this morning. All right. Thanks for the call. I, I got to tell you, too, um, <laughs> it was kind of a crazy weekend. It's weird because in some ways I'm improving my sleep. I'm working on some things. I'm finally seeing some improvement, but there's also some weird things going on with timing right now. So um, my sleep is actually deteriorating in some ways. And this morning was one of those mornings. Um, Lisa and I did an awful lot outside yesterday, and it was one of those hot days and probably pushed it a little too far. And then I didn't sleep good because of it. So... um, Normally, I wake up on my own pretty early in the morning. Lisa had to wake me up this morning, and I'm, I'm kind of groggy, just can't seem to wake up today. Um, honestly, 15 minutes before my open, I had no idea what my open was going to be about. And then two big ideas came to me. I didn't even get to finish one of them. Um, sometimes that's just the way it goes. Let's head off to Ohio this time. Ken, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin, how are you doing this morning? Good. What's on your mind? So I bought this truck in 2017. It's a T680, 264 rears, spec for the 10 overdrive, eating all for ships. Time for a clutch. Also, I'm considering doing a transmission swap to a 12-speed or a 13-speed. What are your thoughts on that? So how my many situation since I purchased the truck changed. I was all flatland before. Now, of course, I'm you know, five years later, I'm rolling hills Got and it. Okay. reasonably heavy. And yeah. OK. So how many miles did you say are on this? Five seventy three. Anybody figure out why we need a clutch? Mm, haven't been that far yet. I'm wondering if I, the, I, it, I, did, I, I would. Does this thing struggle with startability with the 264s? Or was there just a lot of times you were heavy and really riding the clutch to get it going? No, I don't think so. Huh. It, uh, it's just it's just unusual. I mean, I, I'm i trying to think of all the trucks I ever owned, and most of my trucks I took well over a million miles. I can only remember yeah, yeah. one clutch all those years. There's almost never replaced clutches. So under 600,000 miles seems odd to me. And I'd like to, you know, sometimes it just, you just want to know why. Sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah. No, I completely seems understand. Little, yeah, it seems that a little odd. That was kind of my thought, too, because so, my other truck, you know, I was over, over a million miles. And uh, or right, I think I was 956. 58,000, 60,000, something like that when when one of the gears in the transmission started rattling and, and I had him do a transmission and a clutch. That, and a clutch that makes just sense. Just yeah. about at the end of his life. Yeah, you know? that, that I mean, makes it, sense. And that's about I, the I time. did my last last adjustment on it. Right, yeah. yeah. You know, and so I think... The only other thing I can think of with this one is, um, it is I am running a tune in it from Pittsburgh Power. Yeah, that, sh- that shouldn't matter, really. It, it, it shouldn't. I wouldn't think so. No. Um, so it, one of the reasons mine tend to lasted longer too, because a lot of my operations were light, you know, a lot of my trucks ran fairly lightweight with the FedEx doubles in the Southeast where there's no Hills and no poles. And, you know, so it wasn't hard for me to get 1.2, 1.3 out of a clutch. Um, here's the, yeah. the 12 speed auto shift 
would improve drivability on this. It would improve fuel economy. That what is your fuel economy, by the way? Uh, seven three on a ninety day average. Okay. So the That's problem the I, problem comes actually, in. I I have you priced putting a twelve speed in yet? I have not yet. No. I'm going to guess, I'm just going to make a guess based on what's happened to labor rates and parts and inflation that you probably can't swap a transmission for less than 10,000 anymore. That's just going to be my guess. I would assume you're right. Yeah, that would be my guess. Now, if you could go out and with, find... With a, 10, with a 10 to a 12, you're, you're not, you're not going to get the core, uh, you know, so it's going to be a pain. Yeah. Uh, now, if you, you, could, with, if you know, could go out and both find one of these transmissions at a good price and do the work yourself, maybe this might make sense. But here's what I'm thinking. Right. Have you have you done any real um, spending on fuel economy upgrades? I have, yeah. Yeah, okay. I've got fleet air filter, air tabs. High rolling resistance tires. I'm running Bridgestones okay. on the drives, Michelin's on the steers. Tune. I don't run okay. fast. I I typically run around 65, 66, and that's part of the problem. When I when I bought this, it's spec with overdrive, and I thought, right. oh well, cool. Right. Well, back then, that's all we were talking about. You know, running in overdrive and, and lightweight at the time. I right. was good and flat. No, you spec it right. I, I and th- this is part of what happens in trucking. You know, we, I am a big believer in you spec a truck to do a specific job that that's how you make money. Yep. Now, if you change, you right. got to look at it then. Does it make sense to try to alter this truck? Does it make sense to just keep this truck and deal with the fact that it's not efficient? Or does it make more sense? Should I trade this and go get something else? Um, your fuel economy is mm-hmm. not bad. There may be more we could do. And I, I just have a feeling, I think I would pull into Pittsburgh Power with $10,000 in my hand first and say, what else can you do to get me some fuel economy? And I think I'd go through that list first. I just, I have a hard time spending that kind of money when we're probably only going to pick up a couple of tenths, really. I, we're not going to pick up a half mile per gallon with the transmission change. Not that I can see. Okay. Two or three tenths at most. Uh, th- that means we're probably looking at more than 24 months before we even break even. Mm-hmm. So no, for me, not, not, not worth it. When, I was kind of wondering that because I, I, you know, I typically yeah. run sixty-five and and directed six. Or sorry, in in ninth year, uh, sixty-five is just like fourteen fifty. It's at the the top of the power band. So yeah, here here's kind of so, the way I see this. This truck probably gets killer fuel economy at sixty to sixty-five all day long. It does. Yep. There, we're heading if into. I can, if I can keep yeah. it there, and we're we're heading keep, into. Keep it low, I, I can hit eight miles to the gallon all day long. There so. you go. That's what I'm but, thinking. You know, I, we're I heading into a tough economy. We don't know what's coming, and if you go spend right. that ten thousand now, your costs have now gone up for two years. Right. I, I would rather not do that in a time like this. Now, if we knew if we knew it was 2016 and we're heading into three great years of rates, well, then it wouldn't have been so risky. But now's the most risky right. time to even think about doing this when really all sure. you need oh, yeah. to do is, yeah. is run slow. Your costs will come down and then let's just wait and see. I, I just think this is one of those decisions that I wouldn't make right now. It's not that it's the wrong decision. I just think it's the wrong decision for this time. Sure, understand. Because that, that's what I was weighing, you know, with the, the, the new Volvos and the Max and the uh, Freightliners and the fuel economy they're getting. Uh, you know, I'm looking at that and I'm thinking, boy, that sure is enticing, but it not, is. not with the price tag. Right. And, and it, <laughs> it, 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 I, I do can't, think. Can't go there. I do think that it will require, like, the Volvo, their best transmission, in my opinion, is their 14 speed. 
I think that right. we're, we're yep. building engines now that we can benefit from more gears and shorter steps and let the computer do all that shifting to optimize. No doubt. I agree with all that. I just think it's the wrong time for you right now. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. There's that's that's kind of where I was at, and I, you know, in the middle of this, I'm thinking, well, I've heard Pittsburgh Power doing auto, automated to or AMTs to standard shifts, and and the shop I use in Florida, they could probably do that between them and I. We could get it done. Uh, but there again, I don't know if it's if that's a worthwhile adventure because well, the wait, only wait, reason wait a minute, I wait, really wait. bought the AMT. Wait, wait. I maybe I missed something. I don't know if you said that or not. Your plan was to go from an AMT back to a manual. Well, it, it, no, my my thought was to 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 do AMT, but a manual is not out of the question either. Oh, yeah. See, for me, a manual would be out of the question. Hell, I'm not spending ten thousand well, dollars to go back to working harder and being less efficient. <laughs> Yeah. You know, I have to work harder. Well, I have to think about shifting all the time. And if I'm not really thinking about it, then I'm not being very efficient at it. And the point of, like I said earlier, these 14 speeds are starting to make sense. Let the computer shift that thing yeah. multiple times over and over and over to stay right in my efficiency zone. I don't want to have to drive like that. So there's no way I would pay to go yes. backwards yeah. to a manual. Yeah. Well, and that's the thing with this thing. I mean, it, as soon as it sees a hill, it drops down into direct drive. I, you know, it'd so, be interesting to go. Pri- it'd be interesting to go price this. If you go try to buy a thirteen-speed manual, which if you're going to get a manual, that's what I would recommend because that's really oh no question. Yeah, thirteen-speed. Yeah. Um, you'll probably get the transmission cheaper than you would an AMT, but the install is going to cost more. You got to put in a clutch and linkage, okay. and so it might yep. be interesting. You may go price this and find out you're paying just as much or more to get a manual transmission. I'm sure by the time it's said and done, parts and labor, you would be. Yeah, see, I you can't. Know, think, that doesn't make any linkage, sense to me. Clutch pedals, gear shift, right. plates, right? All the you think all that stuff and the labor, the you yeah, know, drive shaft change, and yeah. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I was thinking. That's a yeah, pretty expensive I, adventure to. I I would I would there. take that ten thousand and park it in the bank. It's a whole lot. It's going to do you a whole lot okay. more good during a tough time than it would be spending it now. Right. Okay. Well, then I'll just do a, a clutch and uh, try to get upgraded clutch to cover the change in torque, and hopefully we don't have any more problems with that. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, I, I, it, it, this is the time if you could upgrade that clutch. You know, I don't worry about the tunes and putting this kind of torque to the drive line. It, 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 most good drivers, it'll be just fine. But if we can upgrade, if we're changing the clutch, sure, let's get something a little heavier. Let's, uh, let's see. We're going to head off to Ohio. Paul, welcome to the program. Yeah, I'm out of my normal region. I, you know, yeah. I, it's funny you said that I was going to comment on like, what the hell are you doing in Ohio? You're never in Ohio. I'm on the way to Saxonburg, Pennsylvania. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm on my Northern excursion, my once a year. So. <laughs> That's right. Your um, pilgrimage. Yeah, <laughs> It's worth the drive. That's right. Uh, I'm going to be loaded real close. I'm going to be unloading, making my last delivery near Wheeling, West Virginia, and then just I'm skipping a jump to Saxonburg. You're so. right through the woods, over the river and through the woods. Yeah. Yep. Or so, through the woods and over the river. You're talking in, through the hills and over yeah, past grandma's feet at Sweet okay. Peaks. So, <laughs> That's right. Um, talking about people buying trucks and prices and fuel mileage and everything, there's at the moment there's two companies in Oklahoma sign up for the lease purchase to never own uh, 389 Peterbilt, 280 wheelbase, <laughs> you know all, all the all the wrong all the wrong specs to be successful and make money, but you know, on the lease purchase deal. But 
And then some of the one of the comments yesterday, of the truck speed limited, and it's like. I guess he don't realize he's got to pay for the fuel as well. But, hey, you know, you know it's crazy. I, I, I just thought of something. I think after all these years, I have found the worse deal than even the lease purchase. What's it, that? It's that damn 30 year loan on a new truck. That's worse yeah. than a lease purchase. <laughs> yeah. It really is. I, it, the lease purchase, yeah. if I just buckle down and get through four years, the truck's mine. This, this truck isn't yours for 30 years. And here's the thing. Yeah, I guarantee you, somebody out there is going, oh, but I'll take that loan at 3% and then I'll just pay it off early. No, you won't. I guarantee you this guy's not paying his truck off early. I guarantee you he's not paying one hey. penny more than his $1,062 a month. Yeah, and he'd be struggling to make it. The yeah. tenth payment, let alone the the, the three hundred and sixtieth <laughs> payment. You know? Yeah. Oh man. Oh man. So, but you know, usually when you're on on the way to the shop, you, you never. If you've got a problem, that you know, it's like, oh, yeah, it does it occasionally. But when you're on the way to the shop, it never happens. No, it goes well, away. Yeah. Yesterday, my. Yo, know, yesterday my truck. It. I, I had a turbo lack of turbo boost pressure, but it was when I I got on the interstate, and it's like, oh, I've got hardly any boost, and it was 20 pounds, so I just eased off the pedal, and then eased back on it, and whoop, away it went. Oh, good as gold. Well, this morning, when I left my first delivery, and I you know, started my day, unloaded, and then get on the highway, and it's like, oh, I've got no boost pressure. 20 pounds is all it would do. I only got six vehicles on, and I'm coming up a hill in West Virginia, and I was down to 32 mile an hour. I couldn't go above 20 pounds of boost. So, but I'm on the way to the shop. But it seems to be behaving mostly now. But that, that's usually kind problems of, don't show up when you're on the way to the shop. So, that's a weird you know. boost issue, though. I, I I can't remember. Do you still have a VGT? No, I don't. I don't have an exhaust a pyro gauge. I don't have one of those. No. Yeah. Do you Do you have a variable geometry turbo? Oh, yeah, yeah, v- yeah, yeah. VGT, not e- yeah. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's all, you know, yeah, but that, uh, at least I'm going to the right place to look at it. So. Well, yeah, and yeah. they'll figure it out. But that seems to me like it's going to have to, if we have an intermittent boost, intermittent boost problems are pretty rare. You either have a boost problem or you don't yeah. most of the time. But since yours is intermittent, I'd almost have to think it's that VGT or the electronics. Yeah, so or. Maybe I got a boost sensor that's clogged up or failed or something, but well, you know, I don't I think it's. I'll find out yeah, I don't think it's yeah. just a sensor because you're noticing it in the performance. No. Yeah. 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 It was well, like I, driving an old 350 horsepower. Oh, tr- trust me, I I couldn't get 10 pounds of boost, and I was on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Going down the hill. Yeah. <laughs> going yeah. going downhill was just fine. Coming back up, some of those boy, it was it was frustrating. I'll tell you, a a, ro- a roll scanardly. Yeah, rolls down one hill and canardly get up <laughs> the other side. That's that's exactly what that trip was. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'm on my way to Pittsburgh Pass. So. All right. Well, uh, keep that's us in, keep us informed. All right, that's all I need. Um, actually. I need more. I had a bunch of calls and they just dropped off. So uh, if you want to jump in, there's still some time. Uh, I'll hang out here as long as you've got questions. 855-950-3835. If you are on the line just now, jump back in. Uh, We'll get to your calls. So let's let's go back to what my open... You know, I said I kind of got up late and I was a little uh, groggy and not quite waking up. I'm finally... Starting to wake up now. Um, Moving a little slow today. I did have an open that I wanted to talk about, and then I got uh, a little more sidetracked on the um, the ports and uh, the thirty year loan. When I saw that, the idea of what I started with of this is the best time. Not to get into business, but to start getting ready to get into business. And if it's um, trucking you want to get into, I have some good news for you. 
One of the things you should be doing during this time is you should be learning. You should be building your skill sets. You should be getting your finances in order. So I'm going to give you some tools on how to do that. We're going to separate this out. You're going to get your personal finances in order. You're going to get your business in order and build a good, solid business model. So we'll start with the personal side first. So on the personal side, here's what I would recommend. I would recommend go read or listen to anything that Dave Ramsey has. I haven't looked at his books lately. I don't know what he's got available. I remember the Total Money Makeover was an awesome book. You are going to learn some really, really simple, basic stuff about personal money management that I wish they would just teach us in school. This stuff is not complicated. It's really not. It's really simple to understand. All of Dave Ramsey's stuff is simple to understand. Now, it's difficult to implement because it requires a lot of discipline and sacrifice. I mean, that that's really what good money management comes down to. For the most part, you have to figure out how to conserve, how to not spend. So we have to earn, and the more we can earn, the better off we're going to be. But for most of us, the real key is not in how much we earn, it's in how much we don't spend. That's a lot of what you'll learn with Dave Ramsey stuff, how to create a really good budget. Uh, If the budget doesn't work for you, I have another method that I teach that I use. Budgets are great though. And I always tell people, try the budget first. It works. If it if it fits your personality and your style. Budgets didn't for me. They're too restrictive, um, too repetitive. It just didn't work for me. It doesn't mean they don't work. They do. So try that. Start with Dave Ramsey's stuff. Also, I've talked about this many, many times, a great, awesome, free tool for getting your finances in order. Personal finances is mint.com. So I'm going to give you both educational resources and practical resources on both personal and business. So either want to record this. Well, you know, you don't have to record anything anymore. Um, because all of our episodes are now available anytime you want to listen to them on the app. So all you'd have to do is make a quick note about what day and time um, you are hearing this so you can come back to these resources. So Dave Ramsey and mint.com. If you want a, a more advanced personal finance education, um, I would throw in... Oh, Anthony Robbins book. Um, He brought two of them out at the end. What was it? Unshakable? One of them was actually shorter. He brought one out that was really long. I actually said it's the best personal finance book um, I've ever read. Somebody's probably sending those to me now. Um, Oh, no. Matt did some things on the loan. Yeah. Yeah. Um, $180,000 loan. Okay. He came up with some pretty good numbers there. Um, 30 years at 3% or five years at 8%. Uh, instead of $93,000 in interest, you pay $38,000 in interest on a typical truck loan. Um, the whole idle loan, I said it's a great deal on a loan. It's a horrible deal to buy a truck with. So um, back to the personal finance. Um, Mint.com, excellent. It's free. It'll take you a good solid day, maybe even a weekend um, to, get, to get everything kind of in order. Uh, unshakable, yeah, that was the book. Uh, thanks, Matt. Um, You don't have to read the Anthony Robbins stuff. It's a little more advanced. It's more about investing long term. But if you're going to kind of do this deep dive and get your finances in order, if you want to go a step further to know how to manage your money for your whole life, 
then I would get the book Unshakable. Um, that will handle everything you need to know about personal finance. Dave Ramsey, Mint.com, and Anthony Robbins books. That's all you need. That's an excellent, excellent personal finance education. Everything you need is right there. Uh, Mint.com is going to help you get your net worth figured out. And the beauty of it, to me, the single most important number when it comes to personal finance is net worth. That's it. And I want my net worth to get bigger constantly. That's the goal. I just, I want my net worth to continue to grow. The bigger my net worth is, the more opportunities I have, the less risk I have. So that's an easy scorecard. There's a a really concise plan for your personal finances. Read or listen to Dave Ramsey. Sign up and set up mint.com. If you want to go a step further for lifetime financial planning, pick up uh, either money, master the game. I think that's the long one or unshakable from Anthony Robbins. Now let's move on. We've got your personal finance completely taken care of education and resources. Let's move on to your business because I'm going to do the same thing for you here. On your business, what I want you to do is take three courses on our website. We have three business courses to really get you started correctly. Actually, I think I could throw four in here. I could throw four. Maybe we should do some sort of a bundle. Aaron, if you're listening... Lisa might be listening too. Maybe we need to put together a bundle. We have four courses that would really help somebody get started as an owner operator. We have taking care of business. That's one of our courses. I actually wrote that course uh, and recorded it uh, with Larry Winget. I, that's a, one of my favorite courses. Larry, um, I was on the road a couple years back and Larry and I were talking and he said, hey, I know you're out on the road. Are you going to be uh, anywhere near Scottsdale on your trip. And I said, actually, I'm coming right through in a couple days, uh, but I got to get to an event in California. Uh, And I said, what are you thinking? And he said, well, he said, I just had an idea. He said, you know, that uh, that seminar we did when we were on stage together and we did the, the taking care of business. He said, why don't we just make that a course? And he said, why don't you just come over to the house? We'll sit down. We'll just start recording. Just you and I talking and let's build this course. So I did. I went and did the event in California, went back to Scottsdale, went to Larry's house. Uh, and we sat down and we knocked out this course. And it's it's just about business in general, not trucking specific. It's about all the good business concepts you should understand before you get into business. And we made them really, really simple to understand. That is taking care of business. Um, Also, I have a free course all the things you should be thinking about before you decide whether you really want to be an owner operator or not. That one's called Changing Lanes. Then we have the step by step how do you become an owner operator and do it really successfully? That course is called Stop Holding the Steering Wheel and Start Driving Your Business. Um, those three courses are fantastic for getting you started and you have plenty of time to work through those courses multiple times. Then we could also throw in our fuel optimization course, which teaches you a lot about buying fuel and fuel tax and all kinds of uh, fuel optimization strategies. So I'm looking at these now uh, and I'm thinking we should probably create a bundle. Um, I'll get with the team and we'll talk about that because for the next six to 24 months, um, we'll probably push this pretty hard. This is going to help a lot of people. If you have always wanted to be an owner operator, believe it or not, this is an exciting time. There are opportunities that are going to be coming that we haven't seen in a long time, a way to kind of start at the bottom which is, I think, the best place to start because then you only have room to go up. All these people who started at the top are struggling now because their only path is down. 
and most of them aren't going to be able to handle it. I want to teach people how to start at the bottom because then your path is all up. This is the way you do it. Um, and then, of course, the resource to once you're in business, or actually you could use this resource to start building your business plan, and that's profit gauges. So we just covered everything you need to know to get your personal finances in order, to get your business plan written successfully right from the start. If you have any questions about that, uh, give me a call. You know, we had some calls and they keep disappearing. Calls come in and then uh, by the time I go to get to them and finish my thoughts, the calls are disappearing. So it looks like uh, we just might wrap this up here at the top of the hour. If you want to jump in, um, I'll hang out for a couple more minutes and wait for some calls. 855-950-3835. If I see a call come in, I'll I'll jump on it before we lose it. Uh, Let me go back over that. Personal finance. Now is the time to get yours in order. We are heading into a pretty rough time financially, I think. So Dave Ramsey, read the books, listen to them. I'm pretty sure Dave probably has some courses somewhere that you could take too. Take a course if you want to. Mint.com, sign up. Take a day or a weekend. Here's, here's when I say set up, here's really what you do. What Mint does is it, it aggregates all of your financial information automatically as long as you have access to any account online, which is almost every account today. So all of your credit cards. If you can log into your credit card website and see the numbers, then Mint can see it too. You just log into Mint. You say, I have this Chase credit card. Here's the information. Here's my login. And now Mint pulls all the transactions from that credit card into the system. You can do this for your bank accounts, for your car loans, for your house, for your assets, all of it. And then it does all the math for you and tells you what your... Uh, It helps you build budgets. It'll tell you what your net worth is. So I could just open up Mint every day and look to see what my net worth is doing. And it really keeps me focused on that goal. Let's, uh, we got some calls. So let's grab them before they disappear. Let's go to Arizona. Luigi, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin. Good to talk to you again. A hey, question on the, uh, the idle loan program. We're getting notices that we're going to have to start paying it in October. Have you heard any updates on uh, paying, paying that back? Are they going to extend it again? Or uh, I haven't heard and I haven't gone to look, but I would say this. I, I wouldn't even care or wait. I would just start paying that thing back. Okay. The last I found was it's 30 months from the first day that I guess that they, you know, that they okayed your loan and we're coming up on them. We're getting notes. I guess in October, we're going to have to start paying it back. So. Yeah, I, I, would, I know they went through that whole cycle of extending and extending it. And yeah. And you know, the problem with every time you extend that, the loan costs you more. Right, right. So, you know, at this point, okay. if they've I given didn't you... I not know if there was newer updates yeah, or anything. There, there may be. I haven't seen anything. I, I scroll headlines every single right. day, and I've seen nothing about the idle loan in probably a year or more. So I kind of doubt that right, anything's right. changed. And my point is, look, they gave you 30 months. If you're at your 30 months, I would just start paying it back. Right. Okay. Sounds good. Just... Wanted to hear if there was any updates or anything, but there you go. Good, have a good one. If, yeah, you're welcome. If I see right. anything, I'll certainly uh, mention it. In one of my opens, but I haven't seen anything yet. Uh, let's uh, let's go back to Ohio. Herschel, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin, how you doing, bud? Good. What's on your mind today? Damn it, I did I did it again. <laughs> um. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> okay. A, a truck question, and then a societal statement. Okay. Um, truck question. Uh, Christine now has her third set of injectors in 13 months. I saw Thank that. Detroit Diesel. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
I'm thinking about 10,000 miles. Is that about right? So you can see if there's dilution. I don't want to do too early and waste my yeah. sample money, you know. No, I think you're right. I think 10,000 is a good number. Five would be too early. 7,500 might be a little too early. 10,000, if we have a significant problem, you should pick it up by then. Okay. Cool. So, uh, and then my societal step. Go yeah, ahead. Yeah, real quick, since you're talking about fuel injectors, I thought this was kind of funny. Um, like I said, Lisa and I went out early yesterday and started working really hard out in the yard. I was working in the garden and she was doing a bunch of stuff. And then it got hot and we kept working and we just kind of overdid it. So last night, all we wanted to do was like lay around and do nothing. So we started binge watching this show about cruise ships. It was really fascinating too. A lot of the stuff was really interesting. The ships themselves, the ports they go to, how big they are, just crazy stuff. One of them, this has nothing to do with anything, but I thought it was hilarious. Have you ever seen the the long boats that they do river cruises on? Oh, yeah. Those are, I think those are so cool. I'd much rather do that than a big ocean uh, cruise. But this long boat in Europe, the bridges are so low on the rivers that the, like the, you know how those ships have like the control room that kind of sticks up from the very middle. So they have, you know, a view all around right. that boat. The This particular boat, because this river had so many low, the entire control room would sink down into the ship to get under the bridges. They were talking centimeters of room under these bridges that they had to get under. And not only did the con- the whole control room go down, but the captain actually would stick his head out and he'd have to duck as they were going under the bridges. I th- just thought that was hilarious. Oh my God. I know. I just, oh my God. I, I've never, it was so funny to watch him. The whole control room goes down and then you see the captain's head pop up and as he's coming up to the bridge here's the other thing they've got crazy technology on there they are showing that there's only eight inches between the top of the ship and the bottom of the bridge and there's only 11 inches between the bottom of the boat and the sandbar I mean, that's how close all of this stuff is, and it's being measured by all this high-tech equipment, but you know what they actually depend on to know whether or not they have to stop under the bridge before they hit something? They actually take two water bottles. One's a bigger water bottle, and then one's kind of like a standard-size water bottle, and they put them up on the front of the ship. And if they if the big one gets oh, knocked wow. over, they're close, but they're okay. If the little one gets knocked over, they have to stop. <laughs> That's their method. <laughs> <laughs> you know what that reminds me of? Oh, what? <laughs> Jackie Gleason in uh, Smokey and the Bandit. He tells his son, "Duck, you're gonna be talking out of your ass." And they go under the semi trailer. That's right. Yeah. Off the car. That that's. <laughs> This was just hilarious. I'm like, that's 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 how this the whole thing works. That's how close some of these. Oh my yeah. god! Yeah, and on one wow. on one cruise, and I think the cruise was like ten days. It was like a ten day river cruise. On one cruise, have you ever seen boats go through locks? <clears throat> yes. I, we have one here, Cascade Locks. That's where I live. They built a lock yeah. here to get yeah. around. So. The way it, you, you, you pull in, they have to close both ends of it, then the water either raises or lowers, and then you come out the other side. Um, and it takes a while. And if one boat's in there, you got to wait till that one's done. On one of these river cruises in 10 days, they have to go through 62 locks. Oh, my God. I know. I th- you got to be kidding me. I would wow. hate that cruise. All, all, all you're doing the whole time oh. is sitting waiting to get in and out of locks. That doesn't how, sound like fun at all. How did I get started on this topic anyway? Did I have a point? I have no, I have no idea. You just kind of went off on a tangent. I know, and I think I actually had a point. What the hell was it? Oh, I know. I know what it was. No, I know what it was. Your your injectors. So I'm watching this show about these giant ships, and they have big 
big, really big engines. So on one of these ships, they were changing out a fuel injector. And it was hilarious because clearly as soon as I saw the part, it was the fuel injector, but it's about as tall as an adult male. Oh, wow. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. One person can barely carry the thing. Oh, my God. Yeah, it was a big injector. It was kind of funny. I know. I know. Yeah. But honestly, honestly, watching them, it's way easier to replace their injectors than it is ours. It wasn't that, I mean, yeah, they're really big parts, but the access, you know, they were, they just pulled an injector out and lubed up a new one and dropped it in there. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty wild. Wow. So the uh, status of our society, this I found just unbelievable. Our, my, our oldest grandchild, he is now 19 years old. He has enough piercings that he, if he went down to the local scrapyard and walked by that great big huge magnet that picks up the cars, he would be stuck. It would pick him up. He has that many piercings. He actually told his, and you know, whatever you do, you that's yeah, fine. Exactly. But he right. actually, he he actually told his mom just a couple of days ago. The only way he would take those out for a job of any kind is if he made a hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> the but kid d- does he have any? He didn't unique even skills? graduate <laughs> high school, but no, he only graduated high school because nobody fails now. It would true. That's like, true. What right? What skill set do you have that's worth a hundred thousand dollars a year? Yeah, it just that is where our society is. It's amazing to me. It, it is. It is. And, and you know what? It's sickening. We, it, it is. And we can't blame the kids. That's no. the one thing we can't do that. They 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 end up the way they are because of the way they're raised. And that comes from the parents, the schools, the media. But it's the parents' job to try to control all the other influences. If you just send your kid to school every day and then let him watch TV the rest of the day, he is being educated by the government indoctrination centers and the media. And you can't let that happen. Mm. Unbelievable. I know. I know. And I, I, you know, the problem is, you know, when we, again, I'm going to go back to the book. Part of our problem is we don't have enough people as it is. We need more people to keep our economy running efficiently. Not only do we need more people, though, we need people who understand our economy and business and realize there is no free lunch. There never has been. As a human being, you have to work to survive. Right. Did you see Sleepy Joe got to the end of his teleprompter and it said, end of paragraph, repeat last sentence. And he actually said it out loud. I was like, oh, my God. And this dude is the leader of the free world. Oh, oh my God. I know. Oh, I my know. God. I know. It is. It, I've just, All right, Kevin. Yeah, I'll let you. I appreciate it. I've never seen anything like it. I'm sure it uh, isn't going to end anytime soon. Let's go to Florida. Mike, welcome to the program. Hey, Kevin. Uh, the comment on the injectors, it may or may not help somebody. I, my previous truck, I had a Series 60 and the injector problems. I think I went through two or three sets. It's been a couple of years ago. The the last set I took out, and I decided, well, I'm going to send them off and have them tested. Well, two of the six failed. And these were, you know, OEM injectors. And uh, I found out the testing, the place that tested them actually built them and sold them. So I said, well, if, you know, if they're testing them, they obviously yeah. but, hopefully know what they're doing. So right. I, I bought a set from them. And, and they weren't OEM. They weren't Detroit. I, I don't, it was just a company out of Nashville. And I didn't have any problems with it. I kept the truck for probably it, another year, and it did fine. 
That's a, that's a good point. You know, I just got thinking about something else. When we get into these periods, and like you said, it happened a couple of years ago, and then it kind of went away for a while, and now it seems to be back again where we can't seem to get, you know, good injectors. We're replacing them, and the problem just keeps occurring. I'm almost wondering. We, all, we almost always tell everybody, if you've got, you know, a reasonable amount of miles on the injectors and one fails, just replace all six. I'm almost thinking now maybe it makes more sense to take them all out test them really well and only the replace the ones that fail i wonder if that actually makes more sense now yeah what what i actually did after i don't know the first set or two i, I kind of got frustrated i i kept a set. you know they want the core charge so you got to pull them out and send them and then you wait a day or two to get them back so i just i just paid the core and kept a set yeah so that's I, that's I, not I a bad idea have one so Right. When they pull it out, I had one. It's only in the standard ones. And, um, and the testing place, it just, you know, they're not OEM, but. It, well, it I, that, all I care about are results. You know, I, I nothing yeah, else matters yeah. to me. I, I get it. We've always said, oh, you should try to buy OEM parts. And we said that because used to be that OEM parts had a better track record. But these injectors don't. That's the problem we're running into. So I, I don't know. I don't know if they're testing them or they're just building I, them and selling them. I, I That's know. Kind of what I'm assuming. Yeah. So uh, to find another source like you did where they're actually testing them, well, hell, I think that's a great idea, and it worked for you. You got the results you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. It was. Uh, I believe it was a Pro Diesel in Nashville. I'm sure there's companies across the country that test them, but you find someone who tests them, builds them, and sells them. Yeah. Yeah, that, that may be... Uh, Hopefully uh, that'll help. Yep, I appreciate that. Thanks for the call. All right, um, uh, I'm going to wrap this up. I have a couple minutes here. If another call comes in, I'll take it. Um, nothing major. Uh, I just... Uh, I'm, I, I'm thinking about taking up a new hobby. Um, a couple of years ago, I went and um, kind of messed around with um, kiteboarding here in the gorge. Um, the river I'm looking at is like one of the hottest kiteboarding spots in the world. Uh, 20 minutes downriver from me, huge kiteboarding. Um, so I was down there the other day, and I really, really could enjoy kiteboarding. There's one problem with it. It's all the damn ropes and strings with the kite me and i don't know what it is me and string and rope and knots and all those things i don't get along i'm I, i'm like pig pen i get around ropes and strings and all of a sudden i'm all tangled up i i don't know what that is uh so that was kind of a pain for me and with the kites in our conditions here in the gorge, you almost have to have three kites. So that's a lot of rigging. And so I was busy and I didn't really um, follow up. So I haven't really been doing any kite boarding. Um, I was down there the other day and I happened to see somebody with something I had never seen before. So I went over and I asked them about it. Turns out there's, uh, they've invented a new sport and it's big right here where I am. Um, it's either called wing foiling or wing surfing. So this wing is like a kite, but you do it, you're not controlling it with strings. You actually hold the kite in your hands. And it's got multiple hand holds all over the place because you can spin this thing around and keep it right into the wind and get more power and less power. And it's pretty incredible. But you're actually holding this wing, they call it. And that's what it is. It's a wing in your hand. And if you, uh, like I have a stand-up paddleboard, you can just get on your stand-up paddleboard with this wing and it powers you around. And they would call that wing surfing. But then they have these wakeboard kind of things. And I actually did this a long time ago when I had my boat. Um, you put a foil on a wakeboard. And, and what that is, so the wakeboard, you're standing on it, you got your boots or whatever. And instead of being flat on the bottom or with a fin, it's got a pole sticking down into the water like a big keel on a sailboat and at the bottom of the pole is what they call a foil 
or another wing, basically. So instead of the surface of your wakeboard riding on the water itself, and you know, you, you got the bump and the splash and, and the noise, what happens when you get this thing moving fast enough, and then there's this little pumping action you do, the the wakeboard that you're standing on actually comes out of the water by a foot or two. It's quite a bit above the water. You can clearly see it because you're actually riding on that foil under the water. The foil works like a wing and lifts you up out of the water. It's completely smooth because you're not even touching the waves. It's completely silent and you can get some crazy air with these things because you lean forward and your foil dives down under the water and then you lean back and it'll launch you out of the water. Very cool. But no ropes and kites. and um, So that would be called wing foiling. That's the, the new sport that uh, is catching on like crazy around here. Wing foiling. So... Uh, I might actually go down this week and, and look at getting a wing. I have almost all, all the other equipment I need. Um, I will need to get a foil at some point. I think I'm just going to buy the wing. Uh, I have my wetsuits and all the other stuff from uh, kiteboarding. I think I'll just take it out on my uh, stand-up paddleboard and play around with it a bit and maybe look at getting a foil here soon. All right, we, uh, we're going to wrap this up. We will be back tomorrow for the power hour and the pit. So we will see you then. Be safe, be profitable, be fit and healthy. Always do the hard work and master the journey. I'm Kevin Rutherford.